Essentially, we run through a five-step test. And the determination is, is it a real lease? A real lease, what I'm going to call a real lease, that's my own term. A real lease is an operating lease. It's a true lease in definition and practice. So think of this like you're leasing a car, right? You're not trying to own it. You're just trying to essentially rent this car for a long, it's a long-term rental. That's, that's a true lease. A finance lease, finance, you could call it finance lease, a financing lease. That is essentially you, whether intentionally or unintentionally, trying to disguise your purchase as a lease. And we're going to determine that by running through these criteria. Now, what do I mean by that, disguising it as your own purchase? Well, if you sign a lease, and if at the end of that lease, it says that you are going to own that asset, Right. So let's think of the car example. If you sign now, obviously, this is business to business. We're talking right here. But again, I'm, I'm putting it more into our own understanding. If you lease a car and in that lease, it stipulates that at the end of the lease, you get to own that car. Then we're considered a finance lease, which is essentially saying you're financing it. So think about when you go to buy a car, you can finance it, which is essentially you know using bonds and debt, or you can actually lease it which is just borrowing the car and it's still theirs, you just give them lease payments. With financing, you do get ownership. And this is just important for classification purposes. There's a lot of important background to why these standards are the way they are, the lease standards, right? So think 2008, think uh, when companies want to get certain assets off their books and they want to just sell it and then lease it back, we'll see, you know, sale, lease back. Uh, also, if you just want to uh, you know, there's different tax benefits, right? If you want a lot of cash up front, you could sell your asset and then lease it back. Lots of reasons for this. So it's very important for GAP and FASB that we classify these leases properly. Now, second criteria, when we're looking at our lease, think about your car example. Does the lease grant the lessee, does it grant you an option to purchase the underlying asset, the car, that the lessee is reasonably certain to exercise? So in the lease agreement, is there something in there that says, hey, you can buy this car at any point, and are you reasonably certain to exercise that? If that's the case, then it's a financing lease. Now, the questions will say, you're reasonably certain to exercise it. These are all criteria, and we'll see examples. We'll, we'll talk it through. If any of these criteria are met, even if just one is met, it's considered a finance lease, basically a financing agreement, and by that, meaning you are the owner. Now, the lease term test. This is the life of the lease. Now, I don't have it here, but I will put it, it's 75%. If you're leasing an asset for 75% of its life, its useful life, it's considered a finance lease. And this next one's going to be 90%, so I'll preemptively draw it there. So if I am leasing a car for seven and a half years, and its useful life is 10 years, then this is going to be considered a finance lease. I mean, they're not going to get that specific, but let's say, you know, it, it's going to be more extreme. So, okay, I'm leasing a car for three years out of its 10 years. Well, that's 30%. That's a lot less than 75. If I'm leasing it for nine years out of 10, then yeah, that's over 75, right? They're not going to try to like really mess with you and say, oh, you know, 74.5, anything like, you know, something like that. Next is the present value test. Now, this is essentially just, let's say over the course of the life of the lease, you're going to have to pay $10,000 for you know, over the course, right? So that's $1,000 a year, let's say 10 years. So $10,000 in total, if at the end of the period, at the end of the lease, you will have paid 90%. So if you paid $9,000 in total lease payments over the course of the lease and the car has a value of $10,000, that's 90%. This is basically saying now you've paid for the majority of this asset. It's now considered to be a, a financing lease as if you were buying it yourself. Now, this, they call it the present value because you have to present value factor this. And are you ever going to really have to do that? No, they'll usually just give you and say, oh, the present value factor of you know, your lease payments is 7,000, you know, just give you some funky number like that. Now, this is less than 90%. So this would not make it a finance lease. Lastly, is the underlying asset specialized nature that it will not have an alternate use at the end of the lease? <laughs> I like to give extreme examples here. If you are leasing from a, let's say you have a company build for you a machine that only makes shoes for people with two left feet that are yellow and that uh, have, a, a, you know, a green logo on them, like just so oddly specific, 
that no one else could ever use that equipment or that asset at the end, then yeah, it's going to be considered a finance lease. So all these five criteria, if any one of them is met, then they're going to be a finance lease. If all of these are no, then it's an operating lease. And again, an operating lease is your true lease. What you think about as a lease when you're leasing an apartment or a, or a car finance, this is a financing agreement. That was a lot. That was a lot. And just one more criteria here. So it must meet at least one of the five tests and must be non-cancelable. So that's just another one there. Not, not as heavily tested, but just got to put that caveat there. This is nothing too crazy, right? You just need to remember these five, remember these five criteria and apply this when you see a question. Now let's go back and revisit those other slides now that I've kind of covered uh, the criteria and what this really means. Saw that one. Okay, so yeah, in a financing lease, so in a financing agreement, the lessee, this is you, you recognize the interest expense on lease liability over life using the effective interest method. We record amortization expense on the right of use asset generally on a straight line basis is essentially entering into a financing agreement disguised as a lease. This is what I was saying before. Now, are you doing that on purpose or did you just lease it and you're just, right? You're just leasing it and it just happens to be for meeting those one of those criteria. Either way, you got to classify it properly on your financials. So operating lease, true lease in definition and practice, the lessee measures interest expense using effective interest method, Lessee amortizes right of use asset. Uh, only a single lease expense comprised of interest on liability and amortization of right of use asset is recognized in the income statement. Right of use asset, we'll see this. This is a term, I believe it was started to really be used after the lease standards were updated a couple of years back. And this is essentially, right, think about the term. It's an asset, it's the right of use asset, right? You are leasing an asset, so you put it on your balance sheet as a right of use asset. This means like it's not your asset, but you have the right to use it because you're leasing it. Lease classification, a lessee should classify a lease based on whether the arrangement is effectively a purchase. So again, this is, is it effectively a purchase, which would mean it's a finance lease. Uh, if the, the lease transfers control of the underlying asset to a lessee, the lease is a finance lease. Leases that do not meet any of the finance lease tests are operating leases. Just drilling this in, these will be free points in the exam. Very important to know. And important in terms of how little it is to, to know, right? I mean, once you memorize those five criteria and kind of this underlying concept, it shouldn't be too crazy. It shouldn't be, you know, too uh, difficult of a concept to grasp. And if that wasn't enough, I'm going to go through it more. If you understand all of these criteria, the five criteria already, feel free to you know, skip ahead a little bit, but I'm going to go through them a little bit further. So the transfer of ownership test, if the lease transfers ownership of the asset to the lessee, it is a finance lease, a financing agreement disguised as a lease. The purchase option test, again, uh, this lease allows a purchase option and allows the lessee to purchase the property for a lower price than the underlying assets expected fair value when the option becomes exercisable. Essentially, you're right, it just lets you buy it. And the whole lower price than the expected fair value is just getting you to say that it's reasonably expected you would do it, right? Because if someone gives you a deal to buy something for cheaper than it's worth, you can reasonably expect that they're probably going to do that. The lease term test. So this is the 75%, right? You got to calculate it. They, they're not going to give you clean numbers like I did. We're seven and a half years and 10 years, right? Uh, they'll probably give you other numbers. Nothing too gross, but that's fine. The lease term is 75% of the economic life of the leased asset. Now, keep in mind, these questions will be tricky. They are going to talk about the life of the lease, the life of the asset, right? If it's talking about depreciation, depending on which party recognizes that, you need to depreciate over its useful life, not the life of the lease, right? But again, 75% test, the lease meets the lease term test and the finance lease treatment is appropriate. Lease term is generally considered to be fixed, non cancelable term of lease. Bargain renewal option can extend this period. We'll see this later on. What does that mean? And the difference between the renewal rental and expected fair rental must be great enough to make the exercise of the option uh, reasonably certain at the start of the lease. Let's see a little bit more about that in the next one. So here's an example Walmart leases tablets from Apple for two years at a rental of $300 per month per computer and subsequently can lease them for $30 per month per computer for another two years. 
the lease clearly offer, offers a bargain renewal option, right? So they get a bargain for renewing. So the lease term is considered to be four years because we're under the assumption that this deal is too good to pass up for Walmart. So they're going to renew it. And the lease term, even though it is only two years, it's expected to be four years because again, this lease is too good to pass up. That's the thought process. Now, Walmart, sure, they could actually say no and say, we're good. We only need them for two years, but these are the rules we're going by in our test. This is what you need to know. The present value test. So lease payments, they're fixed payments. You're not going to really see anything crazy. I mean, you might see a payment. You might see someone pay down part of the lease immediately in the first year, but that's still fixed payments. Variable payments that are based on an index or a rate. Guaranteed residual value, right? So at the end of the lease, there's a salvage value. Residual value, salvage value, same thing. And payments related to purchase or termination options, the lessee is reasonably certain to exercise. Again, this is 90%, right? So if over the course of the lease, you are paying 90% of its value, then it is classified as a finance lease. Present value test and discount rate, a little bit more on this. Lessee should compute present value of lease payments using the implicit rate of interest. Now, here's a point. This is important for all of leases, even when we get to the math. We have two rates, the implicit interest rate and the incremental borrowing rate. How I like to describe this is when you want to go finance a car from your dealership, wherever you get a car from, the implicit interest rate is the interest rate that they offered you, is the one that the dealership offered you. Now, you can go to the bank and refinance the car through your bank. Generally, that's a better rate, and we'll call that the incremental borrowing rate. So this rate generally is the rate that you could borrow money at outside of the lease, right? Just independently. Like the company can go and borrow money at, let's say, 12% is your incremental borrowing rate. The implicit interest rate is the rate specific to the lease. Now, this is the main difference between bonds. In bonds, remember, we had our we have our two rates. We have our stated coupon rate and we have our yield, our market rate, and we use both. In this case, we're actually going to completely ignore the incremental borrowing rate. If we are given the implicit rate, all this rate is used for is if the question doesn't give you this rate. So that's it, that's literally it. That's just one trick. It's just it's literally a trick is that anytime you see incremental borrowing rate, you only use it if there's no information given about a rate stated implicit in the lease. All right. Just a little trick there. So this rate causes aggregate present value of lease payments and unguaranteed residual value to be equal to the fair value of the leased asset at the start of lease. So this is going to be the rate you're going to use to do your present value factoring, just like you do in bonds. Again, if it's not given you, you will use the incremental borrowing. If impracticable to determine the implicit rate, the company uses its incremental borrowing rate. This will be common in questions where it has you use one or the other, depending on which is available. Very true. Lease classification, last point. This is point number five, the alternate use test. Like I said, ultra specific, right? Maybe I am having a company build me a mining rig that can only mine, that's only up to code in the state of Arizona and can only mine a certain type of gemstone. That's super specific, right? Super specific. Uh, if at the end of the lease term, the lessor does not have an alternate use of the asset, the lessee classifies the lease as a finance lease. Assumption is that the lessee uses the benefits from the leased assets, so the lessee purchased the asset, right? So is this, just to recap it all, is this essentially a purchase being disguised as a lease?